So, um, I think it's time to make a start. Uh, welcome everyone, Kalispera, Iyad Shamla, hello from uh, central London. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you all to tonight's session uh, on the languages of Cyprus, organized um, as part of uh, this year's celebration for the 60th anniversary of the Republic of Cyprus, organized by the High Commission of the Republic of Cyprus in the United Kingdom, and especially the cultural section and the cultural attaché, uh, uh, Dr. Marius Psaras. Uh, we are grateful and delighted to have been invited to uh, present some of our work on the languages of Cyprus. My name is uh, Petros Karatsareas. I am a uh, senior lecturer in linguistics at the of Westminster and co-director of the Cyprus Center at Westminster. Uh, and I'm uh, joined tonight uh, by the director of the Cyprus Center, uh, Dr. Alicia Christostomou. And uh, a very um, uh, good uh, a, a group of excellent friends and colleagues uh, linguists specializing in the languages of Cyprus. And today we've put together a set of short presentations on the indigenous languages of Cyprus, the languages that have been spoken on Cyprus over the centuries. Uh, the way we will uh, do things tonight is my colleagues will each present uh, a brief um, uh, talk each on a different language of the island. Um, Dr. Elena Ioannidou from the University of Cyprus will talk about Cypriot. Dr. Matthias Kapler from uh, University uh, Kafoskari in Venice will speak about Cypriot Turkish. Dr. Spiros Armostis from the University of Cyprus will present on Cypriot Arabic. Uh, Dr. Christo Pelikani from the University of Cyprus will uh, talk about Cypriot Romani. Professor Anaid Donabedian Dimopoulos from Inalcor in uh, Paris uh, will present, uh, if the sound permits, on Cypriot Armenian. Uh, Dr. Duryea Gürtchebach from the University of Cyprus will uh, present to us the work of the Association for Bilingualism in Cyprus. And last but not least, uh, my colleague Dr. Anna Haralambidu from Middlesex University here in London will talk about the languages of Cyprus in diaspora. We will uh, have the presentations um, back to back. Uh, and I would like to ask you to um, hold any questions, comments, feedback uh, for the Q&A session at the end. We'll have around 15 to 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, in the meantime, you can raise any, uh, any points in the chat. I will keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so you're very welcome to um, add your points there. Each talk uh, is going to be around uh, seven minutes. So we aim to finish uh, at six uh, UK time with another 15 to 20 minutes for discussion, as I said. Uh, there will be some um, uh, some sound uh, that we'll play tonight. Um, so I'm really delighted. I don't want to uh, waste your time uh, with uh, my introduction. So without further ado, I'll uh, pass the floor to my very good friend and colleague, uh, Elena Anidou, who will present uh, some diachronic and synchronic aspects on Cypriot Greek the most widely spoken language on the island. Elena, over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. And let me just check if my slides, oh, hang on, I'm moving. Right, great. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm very happy and honored to be with you today in this exciting event and I'm even more excited that I will be talking about Cypriot Greek, a special variety of the Greek language uh, with a long historic and a strong synchronic presence uh, in the linguistic and the social world. Uh, seven minutes uh, seem such a little time to talk about Cypriot Greek, its history, geography, linguistic characteristics, sociolinguistic aspects. 
Uh, however, for today's short presentation, I will uh, make an attempt to talk a bit about the typological and historic aspects and then move to the more uh, sociolinguistic synchronic issues. Um, so, um, um, Cypriot Greek um, is one of the main modern Greek dialects. It belongs in the southeastern group of modern Greek dialects. It differs from standard modern Greek in every aspect, uh, phonology, morphology, syntax, lexicon, pragmatics. And as far as speakers are concerned, it is transmitted at home. We say it's mitrodidakti. It has its own geographical area and a considerable number of speakers. It's the first language for almost a million Greek Cypriots, um, a number of Turkish Cypriots, and also the Greek Cypriots in diaspora. It is also learned and used by immigrant groups on the island, by Turkish Cypriots as a second language. And recent research has shown that it has been learned by Turkish settlers or Turkish nationals in the north. Um, now, uh, Cypriot Greek has a long uh, and strong presence over the centuries and the millennia in the Greek world. Um, we know from the area of archaeology, but also from historical linguistics, that a version of Greek was spoken in Cyprus as early as the 14th century BC. And the first written scripture we have from the area of Paphos is uh, dated back to the 11th uh, century BC. It is written in the script of the Cypriot syllabary, Kypriako syllabario, uh, which is considered a more elaborated version of Linear B. And in addition, for the current Cypriot Greek, the more contemporary form, it is documented uh, in very important texts in the 14th century, um, Assises and uh, very, the well-known Chronico of Leondios Majeras. And you can see some, um, some extracts here from, from in the slide. Um, as far as contemporary aspects of Cypriot Greek, we know from sociolinguistic research that it is in constant interaction and in a dialogic interaction with standard modern Greek, two varieties of Greek that function in a diglossic manner in Cyprus. So we've got Cypriot Greek on the one hand, which is the home variety for Greek Cypriots. As I said before, it is geographical. It's used in oral interaction. It is not yet standardized. Um, and it's associated mostly with values of informality, humor, authenticity, but also with negative values of seeing as peasant, rude, inappropriate, and often it is seen as impoverished. On the other hand, we've got standard modern Greek, uh, which is the formal variety. It is written, um, it, it's associated with prestige, formality, but also it, it's seen as distance and not authentic. And these two var varieties are are in a continuum, so speakers move between the two depending on, on the occasion and on the speaker. Um, as, um, another important aspect that we need to keep in mind when we speak of Cypriot Greek is that we, we do not speak of one variety, but of a number of varieties according to different geographical areas of the island. So, for instance, we have Paphitica, Carpasitica, and so forth. Uh, linguists and sociolinguists study these phenomena and they say and they see how they change as we move from one area to the other, forming the so-called isoglosses, a form of linguistic border where one feature of language changes when we move to different area. And you can see some example of isoglosses here. This is phonological, um, how uh, we have different uh, phonologies, a different uh, pronunciation of from moving from the east to the west, um, morphology, ending morphology. So, for example, in Bafos and in Deliria, we've got erkundon, the verb ending, while in, 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 in the west, in the east, we've got erkundan. And uh, different forms again, embega, embiga, and 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 so forth. Um, it needs to be stressed that these valuable isoglosses are shrinking, and some are completely extinct, found only among older speakers of Cypriot Greek, and thankfully among speakers that live in diasporic context. So we can study uh, speak speakers in di diasporic context and allocate um, these these uh, isoglosses. And and finally, uh, what is spreading now in Cyprus a lot in the last uh, decades is is the Cypriot koine. 
uh, the what, what, a, a form of Cypriot that um, is, is spoken in the urban centers and it's spreading and it has been studied by colleagues like um, Tiplagu and Der Kurafi. Um, now, uh, finally, my last two minutes, um, Cypriot in terms, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the, the two main sociolinguistic aspects of stigma and identity. Now, Cypriot Greek, because of what I explained before, has a stigma. It is seen as inappropriate, not polite, it's horkadika. And if we see some examples for, oh, my hyperlink doesn't work, never mind. Uh, from um, from a family setting, we can see here a grandmother talking to her uh, grandchild, uh, urging him not to use the Cypriot version of watermelon, batija, and instead to use karpuzi, which she considers to be the proper Greek word. However, we both know that both words are, we all know that both words are, are loan words. So batija is Arabic, karpuzi is Turkish. However, we see this, this notion of appropriateness here. And then we've got plenty, plenty of data uh, from, from classroom research showing how teachers constantly correct as, um, pupils or students when they use the dialect and you have an example here. Uh, however, um, Cypriot Greek is a salient community and identity marker and that might be one of the reasons that it has survived over the years. So um, we've got extensive research exploring um, uh, the use of, of dialect. All of the studies have documented the struggle of the dialect to survive and to create its own space despite the pressure of the standard and of external forces. It is used as a strong indexical marker. Um, it is used, so, so Cypriot Greek in the last, we can say two decades, it's reclaiming its space. It's used in social media, it's used in informal and oral uh, communication, it's in linguistic landscaping, in blogs, in political speech, and on, on, on TV. And you've got an example here of graffiti that you can find in the urban center of Nicosia. Um, you know, a political slogan, uh, sleep well, don't worry, the government uh, takes care of you. But we're, it's using a lot of, of, of dialect. Um, also, what is very, very important, and I'll stop here, is, is that a Cypriot Greek is claiming its space in contemporary arts. So we've got um, a contemporary literature like uh, Constantina Sodiriu, theater, um, music, and children books that are now written in, in, in the dialect. And I'm going to leave you with this, um, this um, it's, it's a bit folkloric, but the, the importance of this song is that uh, it was sung by a Turkish Cypriot in the north, and you can see the way the way he's using the dialect. Mia plusia jo mia ftoshi sinomilia nihan i mia positananos ti jo mia positistihan plusia dispendarfani si pendisintas do invernate alopos puto feon grifa en pubernate eko to paratiri sin dos neos pubernusin ullo nesena hasku sin banu maigi klusin punado seno plastis mucho nastrao husin. Those who speak Cypriot Greek or they know about the older versions understand that this is a treasure and that's what we're trying to do in our research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ellen, for this. It was excellent to close with. Kemali's songs is always delightful. Yes. Um, so without further delay, please keep your questions for Elena for the end. So we'll now move to the second brief presentation by uh, Matthias Kapla who's going to talk to us about the Turkish variety of Cyprus. Matthias, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Petros, thank you everyone. I will shortly also, <laughs> very shortly, seven minutes, I hope I will cope with that, talk about Cypriot Turkish, which is the general term for the different varieties spoken by Turkish Cypriots uh, in Cyprus and outside Cyprus. Um, Cypriot Turkish varieties belong from a phonological and partly morphological point of view to the Western Central Anatolian Turkish dialect group. Um, but uh, it, uh, um, for instance, now I have here uh, an example 
for um, among such shared phenomena with the Anatolian dialect group is, for instance, the voicing of consonants, k to g, p to b. You see here the examples, kubrus for standard Turkish kubrus or patates for patates. But uh, it differs, Cypriot Turkish differs from that in many features. First of all, in syntax and in the lexicon, forming a known dialect with several sub varieties. And the main, but not the only reason for, for this different, for this differentiation is language contact. The main language, uh, contact language being Cypriot Greek in minor measure English and in the lexicon also other languages. Of course, this is due to the history of the island. And you know that uh, today the standard languages, Greek and Turkish are official languages of the Republic of Cyprus. And I will give some examples for, uh, at first, for the lexical copying. The lexicon is um, the, the first uh, affected level of language of, or language contact, of course, the words migrating from Cypriot Greek, for instance. Here I have some uh, examples. You see uh, also the, the, the aforementioned voicing of consonants, puli, it's bully, pandapolio, pandabulia, and so. From English, uh, in this case, I we have in the traffic uh, domain, domain many English words, but also in other, uh, from Arabic. And uh, apart from Halumi and Kulumaka, which is quite basilectal also in, <laughs> in, Cy in Cypriot Greek, I think, and in Cypriot Turkish as well, I have Patika, which I did not uh, make any agreement with uh, Elena, I swear. So we have again the watermelon here. And I of course, also in Cypriot Turkish, karpuz would be much more used. Uh, batiha is uh, batih, uh, batiha is um, uh, basilectal, but uh, I use it for uh, showing this migration of words because it comes from uh, patiha, watermelon, the fruit. But in Greek, Cypriot Greek, um, it's transformed into uh, talking about the plant into patisha, and this gets again to Batisha in Cypriot Turkish as a watermelon, not as the plant. So this is quite, quite interesting. The, the basilectal word for watermelon in Cypriot Turkish would be Batisha. But of course, it uh, pr probably uh, young generation would not even know this word. Um, and we have from Italian many, many words. And these are, uh, interestingly enough, also uh, entering Cypriot Turkish mainly through Cypriot Greek. So Piron, Pironi, Piron, Fasaria, Fasaria, Feseria, uh, Vandofla, Gangelli, and so on. Uh, but the interesting thing, and I can't be in detail here because it would be too much, but the interesting thing of language conduct in this case is not that the words, the lexicon is affected, but deeper structures. So the syntax, for instance, is very much influenced by uh, uh, kind of, a, let's say, Indo-European Indo syntax. And this is an example for the for the word order, standard Turkish is a so-called subject object verb language, as you know, and Cypriot Turkish changes the verb and object in unmarked sentences, and I uh, insist about unmarked. So these examples here, we have also the standard Turkish. Of course, you could also say in standard Turkish, Aç kaputu, but it would not be unmarked anymore. It would not be, the, let's say, the normal, the normal order. So let's move uh, to the sociolinguistic situation, the Turkish invasion of 1974, the, the new geopolitical organization has brought dramatic changes also to language. Uh, that is especially to Cypriot Greek varieties spoken in the northern part of Cyprus. Uh, before uh, 1974, most Cypriot Turkish speakers were bilingual, Cypriot Turkish, Cypriot Greek bilingual, while Greek Cypriots, by the way, were not uh, widely, so this is called unbalanced bilingualism. And so the consequence of the 1974 war was that Cypriot Turkish, which had been in an intense contact situation with Cypriot Greek and moderately with English, was isolated from its contact languages. And the other aspect is that a massive influx of immigrants, mainly from Central, Eastern and Northern Anatolia, who today form the majority of the population in the northern part of Cyprus, has brought various Turkish varieties to the island. Uh, but again, uh, in spite of this, the, the Koine form, at least the Koine form of the Cypriot Cypri Turkish dialect, is reported to be more prestigious than the Anatolian varieties. And Cypriot Turkish varieties are arguably not stigmatized as opposed to many other 
dialect situations around the world. This can be seen by the following interesting observation, namely that the second generation of those who are called also settlers do use different Turkish features in their speech and adult immigrant speakers use at least features of Cypriot Turkish. Um, the dynamic goes together with the standardization of Cypriot Turkish under the influence of standard Turkish as spoken by immigrants and in the influence of mass media especially. And so the consequence is the development of a so-called koine, that is a level variety, let's say between standard and dialect, especially in the cities, and this has been mentioned also for Cypriot Creek by Elena. And uh, it is actually a universal phenomenon, it is known in the, in the Cypriot Creek speech community, as well as diglossia. And uh, again, uh, Elena, of course, uh, mentioned that for the Cypriot Creek speech community. Um, so I don't have to explain anymore a lot. Actually, a lot of aspects mentioned by her are valid for Cypriot Turkish, also the use of, uh, of the dialect in social media, in political slogans, uh, in, in demonstrations and in arts, in poetry and so on. I didn't uh, put any example also because I would not dare to pronounce Cypriot Turkish here. Well, I could have used Duryea, however, but I didn't think about that. So let's um, sum up. Cypriot Turkish is a Turkic variety which was heavily influenced by non-Turkic languages, especially Cypriot Greek. Uh, but also English and lexically also by other languages due to the historical context which left its traces in lexicon but in syntax especially in the deeper structure of the language as well. There is an influence of standard Turkish but without the loss of prestige uh, of the, of the coinized dialect uh, and we have diglossia and uh, coinization. That's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. I, I think it would be a problem if Patiha didn't feature in at least two talks tonight. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's tick that box for me. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. So um, from Greek and uh, Turkish, the two main uh, languages and dialects of the island, we now move to uh, what we can say are the lesser spoken indigenous languages of, uh, of Cyprus. So uh, we'll first go to uh, Cypriot Arabic or Sana. Uh, Spiros Almostis will uh, present to us some linguistic aspects of what has been called Maronite Arabic. Okay, thank you Petros and thank you Marios for organizing this. Um, even though Patiha is of Ara Arabic origin, I will not be talking about Patiha in my talk, I promise. So, um, Cypriot Arabic, also known as Sanna, is one of the indigenous languages of Cyprus. Um, it's also called Cypriot Maronite Arabic because it's spoken by Maronites. And in, Maronites themselves uh, call it Sanna, which translates into our language. Um, it belongs to the peripheral varieties of Arabic, uh, along with Motis, and as I said, it's spoken by part of the, of the Maronite religious group in Cyprus. Who are Maronites? Maronites um, are Catholic Cypriot citizens who adhere to the Syriac Maronite Church, and uh, they, when they uh, immigrated to Cyprus uh, uh, between the 8th and 12th century in several waves, they brought with them their language, which we call Sana. Um, in modern history, there are only four villages, uh, Maronite villages left. Oh, went back, okay. Um, uh, but only one of them speaks or actually spoke the language, Sanna, and that was Kormakitis, uh, which is here, if you zoom in. And um, these are just pictures from Kormakitis. This is just a monument there with some inscriptions in Sanna. Uh, very interestingly, um, this is a, uh, a photo of 
um, um, a street there in much it is nowadays and this is very interesting because uh, the only place in north where you can find street signs having greek uh, names translated into turkish and into english and this shows um, uh, that this is a crossroads of cultures and languages, uh, Gormachid's village. Um, native speakers of Cypriot Arabic, um, um, historically speaking, didn't speak Greek at all. They got to learn Greek at school. This was, a, this was true for, for older speakers of, uh, of uh, Cypriot Arabic. Um, Later on, through schooling, they started learning Greek and they became bilingual in Cypriot Arabic and Cypriot Greek in reality. But nowadays, uh, most young, young people below th uh, 40 are monolingual in Greek. Um, so let's move on to the um, present state of Cypriot Arabic in, in Cyprus. Uh, for the reasons I mentioned, uh, the educational influence, uh, the, the events of 1974 and the movement of populations due to the events of 74, uh, the network of speakers of Cypriot Arabic broke down. So they had no one to talk to uh, because they were scattered um, all over Cyprus, mainly in, in Nicosia after 74. So uh, the intergenerational transmission stopped. Uh, that means that today we only have um, we estimate that we have around 900 speakers of Cypriot Arabic of variable competence. And for that reason, Cypriot Arabic is included in the Red Book of Endangered Languages uh, by UNESCO as a severely endangered minority language. Fortunately, in uh, 2008, the Republic of Cyprus officially recognized Cypriot Arabic as a minority language, which opened the uh, the way to start doing something about it. So um, in 2013, uh, we, we started uh, our efforts to uh, document it, protect it, and revitalize it. And when, when I say we, I mean, um, I'm talking about us linguists, but also the Ministry of Education and Culture, who, who is leading the effort, and of course, the community itself. So, um, some characteristics of the, uh, of the lexicon and grammar of Cypriot Arabic. Um, Cypriot Arabic is conservative and at the same time um, innovative in various aspects. Because it was cut off from the rest of the Arabic speaking world early on in the 12th century, um, it did not follow the development of, of the rest of the um, Arabic uh, varieties. So, it preserves a lot of archaic old Arabic features and even some loan words from uh, ancient Egyptian like the word the word for face is Fandus. Uh, that's a loan word from uh, ancient Egyptian and it also preserves some uh, grammatical structures from an Aramaic substrate. Um, the innovative features now of Cypriot Arabic are due to contact with Cypriot Greek. You, you don't find those features in other Arabic uh, varieties in, in Egypt or Lebanon, etc. So you have words and structures and sounds from Cypriot Greek. Now I'll give you a couple of examples about sounds that may be the same. Just like Cypriot Greek, Cypriot Arabic distinguishes between uh, single and double consonants. So Shata means something, Shata means something else. Um, it also has a voice double consonant, which does not exist in Cypriot Greek, chata, which means something else uh, also. Um, the other sound that exists in Cypriot Arabic and not in Cypriot Greek is the pharyngeal sound, ein. So the uh, sound is found in words like ein, shol, afa, uh, etc. So that, that surely doesn't exist in Cypriot Greek, that's a big difference. And some other characteristics also found in other Arabic varieties are, for instance, the fact that uh, it distinguishes between the pronoun you in the singular between uh, the male, int, if you're talking to a male, and female, in the. So it's you, but different gender. And the same with verb uh, endings, uh, or prefixes, actually. Um, if you say 
in the table, you are, it means you eat, but you're referring to a man. Uh, in the pitacle, it means you eat, but you're referring to a woman. It's same, same with the third person. Now, uh, it also um, has the, the, the dual number. I'm not going to uh, give examples now. I may return later if you have any questions. And uh, as I said, the innovative features of Cypriot Arabic are due to contact with Cypriot Greek. For instance, um, uh, Cypriot Arabic um, borrowed the word potamon, river, Cypriot Greek, but, but don't only borrowed the consonants because being a Semitic language, that's how it works. So it took the consonants and inserted some vowels and created the word patbun, which is the word for river and tamin for the plural with some uh, phonological things going on there. And also in terms of grammar, it, it borrowed endings like uin and diminutives. So bait means house, baitui means uh, little house, small house. So coming back to the effort to revitalize the language, uh, we had to document it and create teaching materials uh, and of course create an alphabet because it was um, um, uh, a variety of oral transition for centuries. So um, now we do have a, an alphabet to uh, be, be able to write the, um, the language and now we have created teaching materials, textbooks, uh, the, the community organizes summer camps at the village where they teach the language, the Sana camps as they are called. And we also provide some um, digital uh, um, keyboards uh, or uh, speakers to be able to write online in Sana, and we see that they actually do this. And uh, it's, uh, it's very pleasing to see that um, Sana is gaining visibility because for the first time ever, um, Sana was heard on TV in Cyprus in a mainstream TV series, Galatia, um, uh, where uh, you had a lot of dialogues and songs in Cypriot Arabic. If we have time later, we can play an extract. So, shukran khtirtas ma'atuni. Thank you for, thank you very much for listening to me. That's all from me. Thank you so much, Spiro. That's, it's great to hear about the revitalization uh, efforts in, in Formakiti, and we might talk about this uh, later on. Um, I'll now uh, move straight to the next uh, presentation by Chriso uh, uh, Pelekani, who's going to talk to us about um, uh, her work on uh, the language of uh, the Cypriot Roma. Chriso. Chriso, uh, we can't hear you. Yes, okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, I will talk about the Kurpetis and their secret language, Kurpetia. Uh, actually, the, the term Roma, I, don't, I will not use the term Roma at all, uh, because the Roma is the term uh, which is commonly used uh, in EU policy and documents and discussions. So I prefer to use the, a term that uh, the, let's say, the Cypriot Roma, the Kurpetis use and identify the, the, themselves. So, um, uh, let's move on. For my for to collect uh, in order to collect the data collection to make to collect data, I, I have done a field work in uh, various places uh, in Limassol, in Paphos, Famagusta, Mor and Tricomo. These are the, pla the places that more most of the Kurpetis lives there. I interviewed uh, 18 Kurpetis ages from uh, 10 to 70. Uh, I have done some uh, 29 recordings and I for the data analysis I use the Pratt software program and I think that Matthias also remember the fair my first uh, uh, you know when I start when I started to collect this data I was very shocked because the only thing that I managed to collect is all is they're all, all only the lexicon and bad words and swear words so I asked Matthias I said, am I going to do uh, to analyze the bad words <laughs> And, and then uh, slowly, slowly, I managed to do um, a serious work and, uh, and to um, uh, record text and to analyze. Um, so you, here you can see some uh, photos uh, from the villages uh, with the Roma, with Kurpetis. 
uh, in various places. Here is in Polenidia in Limassol, uh, in Paphos, here in the uh, Café Ne with the men and with some with one boy. You can see here with the uh, actual, you know, uh, environment and uh, with Roma, with Corpetti, sorry. So, um, um, just a second. Okay. According to the 19, uh, 19th Constitution of the Republic of Cyprus, uh, Corpetis belong to the uh, Cypriot Turkish community. They are not considered as an ethnic uh, minority or as a religious group. The Council of Europe, as you can see here in the table, the, there are approximately 1,250 Corpetis uh, who lives in uh, Cyprus, but uh, Martian Strand, some researchers argue that their number reaches to 2,000 um, or to 3,000 people, starting from the annual influx of Anatolian uh, Roman Lar. Uh, related to their names, they call themselves as not only as Kurbet, but they call also as Ole, Felah, Kori, uh, Felo, uh, Kulufi, Chilingiri, and Chingane. And last three, Kulufi, Chilingiri, and Chingane, uh, they have a strong insulting connotation, to be honest. And they use when they want, I don't, if, if they want to, 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 to say some bad among themselves, I mean, things. Uh, the names of their, of their language is the, uh, in, I mean, except from Kurpecha, which is, let's say, the prestige or the original, the more prestigious, let's say, um, way of saying the language. They called also as Koricha and Tepercha and also Oleje. Of course, the language is only spoken among themselves in their, in their environment and it is uh, spoken, is not written. It's an, in, they use it in, in an oral interaction. Um, Okay, also they use some pseudonyms uh, in order to, uh, I mean, to understand who are they, because they have a lot of Mehmet, for example, or Aisha. So in order to be understood, uh, they use pseudonyms. For example, they use Armudi when they mention, uh, for someone who, who have, uh, has uh, big eyes, Mahmoud uh, um, Arab, Suleiman, because he's black. Me too, probably because it's a long word, a word, long word uh, from Greek, Miti. Chikulet, Alima Nav, uh, Ovic, uh, from the football players, Latan uh, um, Ibrahimovic, Karaishe, Pire, uh, Paluze, some who moves, a girl who moves like gels. Kola, uh, Pipirik, uh, with Fjar, Shitan, uh, which is, it means beautiful, and Chipine. Uh, which means thin or delicate lady. So, um, as you can see here, there are uh, in the previous uh, slide. Uh, these pseudonyms they have some categories. I mean, they are they are uh, differs. Maybe some they are related to uh, professions or popular character, uh, popular characters or animals or physical characters characteristics and mostly are based on the physical characteristics. There are also um, some lexical similarities between the Gurpecha and Teperche. Teperche are spoken in, the, uh, in, uh, in Turkey from the Aptal, so Aptal's language. Uh, as you can see here, the, here the word Ashinla, we have also in Gurpecha, Ashinla, which means fake, Chukel, Chukel, Cherle, Cherle, Ushla or Nushla to sit, Halan, 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 uh, with some very, very few phonological, phonetical, uh, phonetical um, changes. Here is an one example of my transcription. Uh, Petro, can you put the recording if it is possible? Yes, just one minute. Okay. Civar, Hrisom, the flight, Medicina, Kilgun Kavedeler, Kajibashka Gajoyu, Hapedeler, Hrisom, Vepashka Gajisun Margajie, Pizimaha Lede Birgajiba, Zamar Falanga, Kenagi de Lelim, Zanusun Senning Falanga, Pilsen Berabe, 
Kacıyla gidelim, salımıza baktıraladık. Kacı sunmadı bize, destini sanıyor. Ben de bir dedim destimi sunmadı bana. Sen Merin ile kıl gün kahve edelim. Çünkü sen başka kacoyu hap edelim. Hadi. Merin'i de isteyelemen. Merin'i şükür kaco. Ama senin Merin hoş olalayacak. Sonra sen şuğla gidelim. Merin'e sonra rabın olalayacak. Sen kıl gün sorunların olalayacak. O bir kacoyla kahve edelim. Sonra seni bırakalayacak. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. I don't know if the Turkish speakers uh, can understand or if you can understand something. Uh, let's see the translation in, in uh, English. It's very you know, nice, the, this story. There is a woman, Hriso, every day she argues with her husband. The woman fell in love with another man. My dear Hriso and another woman told her in our neighborhood, uh, neighborhood there is a woman. She tells the fortune. Uh, let's go to tell you the fortune. One day we went together to this woman. She told us our fortune. The fortune teller told, uh, told me, give me your hands. And I gave my, her my hand, hands. Uh, she told me, you fight with your husband every day because you are, uh, you are in love with another man. And you don't love your husband. Your husband is a handsome man, but he will not make you happy. Then you will go uh, with your husband to work and then you will have some money. You will still have problems every day. You will fight with your husband and then he will leave you. Not he, her, but he will leave you. It was a nice uh, story, actually. Thank you. And uh, here, phonetically, we can see that uh, the phonetics and phonology of Kurpecha is the same as in Cypriot Turkish dialect. Phonologically, Kurpecha exhibits as many phonemes as Cypriot Turkish dialect does. For instance, it remains the new and the phonemes like in Fana or Nu. It lacks the G phoneme as it is found in learned words, usually of French origin. No such words appear in, in the corpus. Kurpecha differs from the standard Turkish in the same way as Cypriot Turkish does. For instance, the conjunction da and the suffix cha do the following from, uh, do the following, uh, the follow, do not follow, sorry, the uh, from ham, harmony. So instead of in standard Turkish bende, bende, they say benda or instead of kurpeche, they say kurpecha just. Uh, morphologically, the plural suffix lar changes in, into nar. The same happens in the Turkish dialect uh, as well, uh, on lar on, into on nar. Uh, the postposition ile also appears in the in Gurkech and Cypriot Turkish dialect as an enclitic suffix in the form uh, inan to mark the instrumental case, um, latainan, which means with the boy. And also the same uh, phenomenon happens in Cypriot Turkish dialect and also in Greek. The lack uh, of the, I mean, is the uh, COVID element, let's say, uh, from the Indo-European language. Uh, the lack of the question particle, uh, me, in yes or no question, gidelim me, shall we go gidelim in Cypriot Turkish dialect, and uh, the same phenomenon happens in Kurfecha, halanalim, pame, in Greek. Um, this is very important, the, the, uh, related to the verb formation. The verbal verb ala is uh, added to the Turkish verb steps. For example, the verb yapmak, uh, they make it as yapalamak, and or uh, the verb gitmek, uh, to go, they make it um, into gitelemek, they add the elem, ele, the suffix ele. Uh, this happens only with the, uh, the verb that they use from an aleto, yes, uh, in um, in Turkish. And uh, let's move on. You can see here some example. In syntax also, Corpecha displays some syntactic constructions that follow Indo-European principles of close combining. After the personal modal expression such as gerek, lazing, it is necessary. The verb is, uh, is in the of imperative or subjunctive. So let's, they say lazım pine im hap instead of um, uh, hap pinem lazım, each mem lazım. The lexicon is very, uh, oh, sorry. The lexicon includes loan words, lex as Matthias also said, lexical uh, um, copying uh, from uh, various uh, sources, uh, from Indo-Aryan language family, uh, but also from Indo-Iranian and from Afro-Asiatic language family. Most of them, uh, you know, you can see here, this, there are 
various from through, they they come from um, they have different semantic fields from uh, related to house clothing animals food and drink body etc uh, most of the words are from romani uh, language so what is kurpecha is a um, creole language with with the basic code of cypriot turkish and loan words from various sources uh, source language such, uh, such as romani and arabic thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much, Chris. It's really interesting about a lesser known variety of, uh, of Cyprus. Um, next uh, up, we have um, Anaid Donabedian from uh, Inalco in Paris, who is due to talk about uh, the Armenian of, of Cyprus. Anaid, can, can, can you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Okay, great, great. Oh, I don't know why my slides appear at like that. It's a pity. Okay. Uh, okay. So, good, good evening, everybody. So, uh, speaking um, uh, the the the, I will speak about Armenian. Cypriot Armenian, I don't know because the concept of Cypriot Armenian is not so obvious. Uh, so that maybe I have to contextualize a little bit. This despite the short format of the presentation. Why Armenians in Cyprus? So uh, the, the presence of Armenians in Cyprus is testified in the Byzantine era. Uh, and uh, um, the Crusades were strong contacts between Armenians and Cyprus, ruled by the same Frank dynasty of Byzantians. At, and at this time, Armenian was already, already one of the official languages of the Kingdom of Cyprus. Um, uh, as a result of Cilicia's conquest, conquest by Tamerlan, some 30,000 Armenians fled to Cyprus. During the Ottoman period, uh, Armenian population uh, diminished, but uh, as a result of uh, ethnic persecutions in Asia Minor, uh, 1984, 96, uh, and in 1908, and finally the genocide of 1915, um, new waves of Armenians fled to Cyprus, and here is the map of the villages uh, they originated from, and some of them definitely settled there. Um, so during the 20th century, uh, some circulation is also observed with uh, Caucasus, but I will not uh, go into detail for this. And you, the demography of Armenians in Cyprus is usually said to be 3,500, uh, 2,500 of them being historically uh, Cypriot Armenians. What about now the language? Armenian is a language documented since the 5th century and the creation of the Armenian alphabet, which gave rise to an abundant and precious literature and some of the jewels of the universal literature. Um, the language of the 5th century, which is a, a, an Indo-European language with some non-typical features from Indo-European language, probably due to the Urartian subscript. Uh, so in 5th century, the language seems very homogeneous, but there are indirect signs about a very contrasted situation in vernacular language spoken in the everyday life. Um, during the history of the language, written language became less and less cut off from the vernacular, and dialectal differences arose even in the literature. This map drawn in 1908 shows the main Armenian dialects classified in two main groups, Western and Eastern dialects. Um, and those groups uh, provided the basis for standardization of respectively Eastern Armenian, now the official language of the Republic of Armenia, and Western Armenian uh, used in the Ottoman Empire and in the diaspora stemming from it, so including Cyprus. Both are granted with a full-fledged oral and written tradition. Um, uh, okay, so uh, coming back to the map showing from where originate Cypriot Armenians, it clearly appears that Cypriot Armenian is Western Armenian. Um, uh, Western, uh, um, so Western Armenian as a language of a diaspora spoken only by bilinguals or multilinguals 
is subject to language fluctuation in several parts of the world. And since 2010, it has been included into the Atlas of Endangered Languages established by UNESCO. Nevertheless, a huge network of everyday schools inherited from an Ottoman tradition is still working all over the world, about, about 20,000 students in the world, and especially in the Middle Eastern community, communities, including Cyprus. So uh, when we speak about the language and about the literacy for Armenians, there is not, it is not a diglosia as we know for other languages, but it is also, there is some difference. In this regard, Cypriot Armenian doesn't diverge from standard, standard Western Armenian developed in Constantinople during the 19th century and now maintained by the institutions mainly settled in Lebanon. In fact, circulation between Armenian communities of the Middle East has always been active and Cyprus is not an exception. The Melkonian Educational Institute set the Nicosia, Nicosia in 1926, initially an orphanage, became later uh, one of the most prestigious Armenian high schools in the world, attracting attracting students from and the teachers from uh, 40 countries all over the world. Uh, and uh, playing, it was playing until 2005, a crucial role in the transmission of standard Western Armenian to the next generations. Uh, for the whole Armenian diaspora. Uh, Armenians have an official status of ethnic minority in Cyprus since the independence. And actually, Cyprus is the only country in the world where Western Armenian is fully recognized as a minority language with corresponding status according to the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. And the robust and dynamic network of Armenian schools, the called Narek schools in Cyprus, and having the status of public schools is also working until now. So this is the official standard situa situation in which one can hardly detect any separate specificity language itself, uh, which is just standard Western Armenian. And uh, I have to say also that I never did uh, field work in Cyprus to have a deep knowledge about the, uh, the, the, the features of the, uh, 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 the specific features of the language in Cyprus. The uh, real practice of the language could be some different, of course, as a result of the urbanization and the turnover of generations, making Greek more and more familiar to Armenian families in Cyprus, most of them being perfectly bilinguals. One can observe some specificities in the way Cypriot, Cypriot speaks Armenian with regard to communities from other countries, especially from Lebanon, which tends to be considered as the etalon. Changes in intonation, microsyntactic calcs, other syntax induced changes. But in Cyprus, they are probably less marked that it can be in Greece with the same language combination. What I would like to point out today is a less noticed phenomenon related to the perception of Western Armenian by Greek Cypriots. Surprisingly, although Greek Cypriots usually know very well uh, who are Armenians, they are barely able to recognize their language in this public space. I heard there are testimonies uh, saying that um, they make mistake with Turkish language. There can be two explanations for this and they are not mutually ex exclusive. Despite being an Indo-European language as well as Greek, Armenian has several typological properties that strongly converge with Turkish. This is intonation and stress. I forgot to change the, the, the slide. Intonation and stress. Um, since uh, Armenian ha has uh, not a mobile uh, uh, word stress uh, as it is in Greek, but it is fixed on the last syllable, just like uh, French or Turkish. Uh, second, the sentence structures tend to be SOV with the preverbal position being the default focus position attracting the sentence stress, just like Turkish. The first properties was acquired by Armenian before even the classical period, period where uh, when the language is first documented. It is one of the properties of Armenian by contrast with all the other Indo-European languages. The second was acquired uh, in contact with Turkish. Anyway, even if they don't come back to the same origin, origin they converge in the, in the giving a Turkish-like intonation to Armenian. Uh, just I, I'm um, already eight minutes. I don't know. Can, may I finish, Petros? 
Uh, so consonant system of Armenian is very developed and uh, uh, has a full range of apical fricatives, and palatal fricatives. Uh, the fact that some of these consonants are not represented in Turkish is not so obvious for a Greek-speaking person. And what strikes much more is the fact that some unknown sounds are represented and evocate Turkish. The same occurs with the um, what is in the slide, the mid-central vowel e, uh, uh, unknown, unknown in a wide range of languages, including Greek. I'm not sure about the Cypriot Greek, by the way, but uh, existing in Armenian as well as in Turkish, if, even if, if they are not exactly similar in Turkey, it is small backed. Uh, so, and uh, um, th this is also this also contribute to the this this. Uh, so, I will shorten a little bit. And uh, the the last phenomenon which may converge with the above mentioned and favor this confusion is the fact that in spoken or dialectal Armenian, a range of Turkish words are used without phonetic or morphological adaptation because of typology, typological reasons. Um, uh, uh, and it uh, doesn't allow to incorporate the, the words into the target language, as it is the case in Greek. When in Greek you say tebelis, uh, it is not the Turkish tembel. But in Armenian, nominative case is a bare case, and no phonetic ab adaptation is necessary, and uh, it sounds just exactly as in uh, Turkish. The words about uh, the, the words I am speaking about are, of course, not allowed in literate Armenian, um, but nevertheless, they occur quite frequently in the informal oral speech, especially. Um, so no, I will stop here because I, I, I take too, too much time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe in Thank the discussion. You. Thank you. Maybe we can return the discussion. Uh, there's a little bit of super uh, Armenian data for you in the chat. Uh, by Alexander. We thank Alexander so much. You might want to, to write that down for your um, for your data set. Thank you, uh, Anaid. And um, now we move on to not a language of Cyprus, but some language work that is being done on Cyprus on bilingualism and promoting uh, bilingualism. So our next speaker, Julia uh, Gucheba, who will talk to us about the activities of the Association for Bilingualism in Cyprus, Silogos Iglosias Kipro, Kubros Ikidililik Dernei. Duria, over to you. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you all for uh, such a beautiful event. It's an honor to be with you here. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about two official languages of, uh, of Cyprus, Greek and Turkish and also about this uh, association for bilingualism in Cyprus, learning the language of the other. Um, although the Republic of Cyprus has two official languages, today, unfortunately, few people in Cyprus are bilingual. Since these languages uh, are thought uh, as a second, uh, as a foreign language and not as a uh, second language. Because of the political situation, the understanding of bilingualism in Cyprus is still in progress, and the Association for Bilingualism was established in 2019 in order to encourage bilingualism in Cyprus and contribute to the creation of conditions favorable to the learning of two official languages, Greek and Turkish, in both Turkish and Greek Cypriot communities. We also support the other languages spoken, especially in Cyprus. Um, one of the important aims of the Association for Bilingualism in Cyprus is to eliminate the language barrier, which is a huge problem for the communication between two communities, communities and to contribute to the efforts for peace and re reconciliation in Cyprus. Um, let me change the slide here. Um, up to now, we have more than 140 members and about 50 students, include, uh, students including adults and kids, learning Greek and Turkish. 
Um, this number is encouraging but needs immediate support from the authorities responsible for education to develop language policy for the teaching Greek and Turkish. Um, in addition to Greek and Turkish courses, the association offers also translation workshops and bilingual language courses for kids. You can see here our language courses offered and we recently start offering uh, these courses for this semester. Um, we have also, uh, we have already organized several, uh, several bicommunal and bilingual events and periodically different kind, kind of events are scheduled in both languages so both communities can attend these events without language barrier. Um, we changed the slides just a second. It is important to say that we collaborate with different organizations such as Cyprus Linguistic Society and have been supported uh, by the European Union uh, Grove Civic Program and United Nations for our uh, educational programs. Besides the events, bicommunal cultural trips are also organized periodically. Thanks to these trips, most people from different cities of the island have the opportunity to practice the, uh, the target language. And uh, during the lockdown, all lessons have been done online and our, our uh, outdoor activities are limited to bicommunal online language cafe. Due to the COVID measures and restrictions on the checkpoints, there is a limited real-time communication between two communities. We, as an association for bilingualism in Cyprus, we try to keep our students motivated for language learning. I hope that the checkpoints will be full, fully open soon so that our crucial face-to-face -face bicommunal activities and language learning can continue. You can follow, uh, you can follow us uh, follow our events and activities on our social media accounts and you can uh, join in our bilingual and bicommunal family. Before closing, I would like to say that we are truly committed to, to this work because we believe that learning the language of the other is an important factor, improving communication, understanding each other and building the trust that is so needed in our country. Thank you so much. And to Petros, I would like to uh, show our video if we have time. Thank you so much. Petro, we don't hear the video, we don't have voice. I'm sorry about that, I don't know what happened there. I'll just put the link uh, in the chat room so you can all um, hear it, if that's okay. You can watch it at your own times. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, uh, the next speaker for today, uh, which is Anaha Lambivu, uh, who's going to talk to us about the languages of Cyprus in diaspora. They contribute to the large communities of Cypriot um, that live abroad and not least in the UK and London, where we are currently situated. Anna, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Petrus, for organizing, and thank you very much for the um, invitation. Uh, I hope you can see me and hear me well. Okay. Um, so, I mean, Petrus gave me this very um, ambitious title, the language of Cyprus in the diaspora. You see that I'll focus very much on um, 
on Greek Cypriot in, in the UK, really. Uh, but I want to start by saying there are a lot of Cypriot communities that are well established uh, around the world. Um, um, there's a community scene, obviously, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Greece, in Canada, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Australia. Uh, and But they're all the most established and the oldest and most organized uh, Cypriot community abroad is in the UK. Uh, depending on, on different estimates, they're between 1,500 and um, 3,000 um, uh, Greek Cypriot or people of Greek Cypriot origin in the UK and the majority of them are um, in London, but also in other uh, major cities such as Manchester or Birmingham or Bristol or Liverpool. Um, and then as what we see in, in most uh, migrant communities, a generational shift. Um, so early Greek Cypriot migrants were largely uh, monolingual, monodialectal in Cypriot Greek, and they had very rudimentary uh, knowledge of either um, a standard Greek or English, um, but then the second generation would uh, would become perhaps bilingual English and also in Cypriot Greek with their parents, and then the third generation uh, would become very dominant in English with a very limited uh, access to Cypriot Greek. Of course, there are a lot of uh, forces there that try to reverse this um, loss of Cypriot Greek. Um, there are different Greek. Um, uh, Greek speaking media, I put there Parikiaki, one of the newspapers, the Greek schools, um, and of course um, uh, the Cyprus, uh, the culture sector of the High Commission here. So, how is uh, Cypriot Greek uh, in the UK? Um, it's quite interesting because, uh, as Elena mentioned uh, in her first presentation, there are words and sounds that um, originate in traditional Cypriot Greek varieties that are now thought to be obsolete in Cyprus, are no longer used. And these are now, the, um, in the diaspora, these are used by um, younger members, not just by older members. So I put there Burkos and Rishonas, also Mavluka for pillow, and so on. There's also a considerable amount of code switching um, and the use of English, Cypriot Greek, and Standard Greek in the same sentence. And I put an example there from, um, uh, from Petro's word. So, Singenis to Andramu, Almost Puvrethum and Parapano, the older ones, if they escape the Mestes exceed the Dominta Chronon, and not to Miliso Linga, the Oti and Juno Bucatalam, so no, then Domilum, and then Domilum a lot, to be honest, and I shift a lot. And there you can see some uh, syntactic structures from English as well. But this is not just by younger, second, third generation uh, migrants, also first generation, they do a lot of uh, code switching. And what uh, we found particularly interesting are new words and structures that are uh, characteristic of the migrant community here um, that have been borrowed into um, uh, Cypriot Greek from English. So they're words uh, that come from English, but they have, um, uh, they have been adjusted to the morphological rules um, and phonological rules of uh, Cypriot Greek. So I put there some examples like Muvaro, I move, Flano for, uh, for flannel, Chabua for chubby girl, uh, and also a lot of place names like Fishbury Park for Finsbury Park, Kungri for Wood Green. Um, now, there are different attitudes towards these Gringlish words. Um, some are quite positive, but, but really because they are initially they were created by first generation migrants who have very limited. Uh, command of English, and in many cases, uh, these Gringlish words replaced uh, native Greek words. These were then later adopted by uh, second generation members of the community, but they were sometimes or often assigned negative values. Um, uh, for example, they were thought of as Greek slang or something to show lack of education, uh, that is not proper Greek, is not proper English. Um, and, and speakers would often express their preference for, for the standard Greek equivalent. So they would prefer Leoforio instead of Paso, or Tachydromo instead of Postages. Um, so this very unique lexical stock that is emblematic of the, of the community's linguistic history and also social history and cultural history is really facing the threat of disappearance as new generations of speakers uh, tend to avoid them. And that's why Petros and I came up with this idea of the Gringlish project 
what we want to do is capture as many English words as we can and to involve the community in doing that. So we wanted to create a very permanent record of the community's uh, linguistic history. Um, so we asked all British uh, Greek Cypriots to upload Gringlish material, to upload words and their meanings, but also photographs, stories, thoughts, comments, even feelings about Gringlish words. Um, and I put there the website of the project, you can, uh, you can check it out. Uh, some of the most, so I thought I'd share with you some of the most uh, frequent words. Um, to paso, carpeton, to kitchen, to ketlon. These are, these are some of the words that come up all the time. Other very frequent words are fishatico for fish and chip shop, um, mapos or mopos, um, to postofi for post office, Isosinges for sausages, to televijo for television. But you can also see there are some of the stories. So uh, Kiri there says, my mother came over from Cyprus in the 60s, lived in the south and north London, and developed a Greeklish dialect with her cousins. Growing up, my sister and I thought this was Cypriot Greek dialect until we went to Greek school. Lol. So you can see there, obviously, that disjunction between what you think is Cypriot Greek and then you go to Greek school and then the realization that it's not even Cypriot Greek and then you find out that actually you're not even supposed to speak Cypriot Greek either. Standard Greek is the, is the required. So you can see how um, negative values uh, can be attributed to these words. Um, other words there are boksha, chika for chickens, karka, sausages, sort of vinegar. And you can see there are a lot of words that um, um, are associated with a fish and chip shop because obviously a lot of uh, Cypriots had uh, fish and chip shops. Um, and there you can see a picture from our uh, Twitter account and some of the comments. There are so many memories hearing these words. Um, there is also a lot of Gringlish place names. So, for example, Sheppy Bush, Wembley, Wimbledon, but also words that, that refer to specific shops like Sainsbury or Max Spencer's. Uh, Woolworth. Um, and there you can see obviously a lot of variation. So uh, Petrus and I would have to have um, quite a bit of thinking on how we're going to uh, present all those words just because it's such a non standard variety um, with no written form. So there's so much variation. But what I found particularly interesting was some historic Gringlish. So um, some uh, words that are no longer really used, but some people remember from their uh, grandparents, some people that are now, you know, old, older themselves, and they remember from their grandparents. Um, so there you can see some a uh, few words from the vocabulary used by Cypriot soldiers in the British armies during the Second World War that uh, that participant remembers from his grandfather. Ogambos for camp, itenda for tent. Now this, oh, I mean, one could argue also used in Cyprus. Um, in barracks for barracks or colonellos or majors, um, or captain or sarges, or copros for corporal, i brenga, i stenga, i machinga, or absentis, or sentries, or epis. Um, Alexander said that some of these are still used in Cyprus, and you're right, because I was discussing that with my brother. He said, well, I used to use that, some of these words when I was in the army. So, so yeah, you're quite right there. Um, and, and that's obviously a big uh, piece of work to figure out which of those are, are really, you know, London-based or UK-based and which um, uh, are also used in Cyprus and, you know, what was the direction where, the, where they were first conceived and where they travelled. Um, you can also see their vocabulary used in clothing industry during the 70s and the 80s. Um, uh, and this come up a lot because that was another profession that a lot of uh, Greek Cypriots uh, took on them uh, when they came, especially in the 60s and 70s and you know late 50s. So imashina for the for the machinist, and um, but actually and also for the machine, um, uh, opandos uh, for the bando, to overlocki, i overlocka for the for the machine and also for the machinist. Uh, okate, to titai, to kapotin, i wedges, to overtime, quality control, I love that one, or benches and to fabric. Um, and you can see how um, these words are not just obviously indicative of, of this Greenglish phenomenon, but also tell us a little bit about the cultural 
um, history um, and the professions um, and what they used to do. Uh, now, what were the attitudes? Um, and that was really interesting because obviously most of the people that actually engaged with our project, there was a bit of a selection bias because they would be positively predisposed. Otherwise, why would they bother uh, to contribute? Um, but we did have some negative uh, views as well, which I found fascinating. So, for example, Gringlish are just mispronunciations, transliterations and adaptations of our uneducated immigrant grandparents who did what they could with the very little they've known. Just some silly word creations which fall into the realm of dad jokes. Uh, and actually, we had not a massive number, but we did have quite a few um, reactions like that, that you know, they're, um, they're not proper Greek, they would like hindering uh, uh, proper Greek learning by this Gringlish uh, project. But actually, the majority was uh, very positive. Um, Gringlish was seen to celebrate the diverse and richness of organic dialect in both languages, is nostalgic, uh, and informative, so a lot of the participants view that as the language of their grandparents, something that, you know, reminds them of their childhood, perhaps. Um, and really what we're witnessing is a development of uh, more positive views towards uh, Gringlish. You can find some of these sometimes lively debates on our Twitter account, uh, but I think these changing attitudes are really indicative of changing and contradictory attitudes towards um, all of the languages of Cyprus in the diaspora. And we obviously I talked about Gringlish, but there's um, a similar uh, phenomenon with uh, Turkish Cypriot in London, because there's also a big Turkish Cypriot community in London, and this uh, new hybrid code between uh, Turkish Cypriot and English. And with that, I thank you very much, and um, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Anna. That, uh, that's great. What can I say about our project? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank, a big thank you to everyone, to all the presenters. Um, it was amazing, amazing um, journey around this, the languages of Cyprus and efforts for bilingualism in Cyprus. Um, so the floor is open to um, a few questions and some discussion. We have around 10 to 15 minutes, uh, if you would like. Um, so you can post your questions in the chat, uh, or you can raise your hand and turn on your mics. Um, I guess while people are gathering their thoughts, um, I would like to ask the panelists. Um, so we focused a lot on the indigenous languages of Cyprus. So the languages have been spoken by communities that are thought been there for some time. Um, but what about the languages of immigrants in Cyprus, the languages of groups of people who um, found themselves in Cyprus more recently, uh, either like economic immigrants or uh, perhaps even uh, refugees and refugee children. Um, Cyprus has, um, has been a place where refugees arrived and have settled recently. So um, what is the, if I can say, what is the, um, uh, the situation with immigrant languages in Cyprus? Do you want me to? I can start. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Um, I actually, but then because of time, I removed it. Um, it it's very interesting because um, there are. It's like they're invisible. So you know, we, we've got all these languages that uh, have arrived, have been arriving over the past thirty years. Um, from, you know, uh, Russian and Ukrainian and Bulgarian and then um, Asian languages. So it's, it's, it's quite a, a big number and we don't have a lot of research on them. Um, what's happening is that two things that I find very interesting. So there are, the languages are here and they're interacting with Cypriot Greek a lot. So people, um, immigrants would want to learn Cypriot Greek uh, because it's the language of communication and it, a lot of things are happening there when you know they go and you know they're being taught standard modern Greek so you know that that's 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 a, a, an area that we would like to look into uh, the second is that uh, because in terms of policy we you know n no one cares about their language so they're starting to create their own community schools and actually, I've got a PhD student who's looking in the Arabic and the Bulgarian school 
in 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 Cyprus. So so you know they're starting to you know try to kind of teach uh, in a more literary term their language. That's from me what I know. Thank you, Elena. Um, there's a question from Lorna. If someone could comment on the creativity of the dialects, uh, how, for example, in uh, in Cypriot dialect, Cypriot Greek, I assume the way one can create an expressive verb out of combinations. So the example that we have is le shopping uh, and the creativity that infiltrates English as well. Um, so who would like to take up the question about creativity? Perhaps Anna could say something about the creativity in English? Yeah, I mean, obviously creativity and change is, um, is indigenous in all languages, in all varieties, but I think especially in Gringlish, because it's such a non-standard variety, um, it's, it's really interesting to see that a lot of the words that people think are very common are actually just used by their own family or, or the other way around. So a lot of the words that people think that they just use with their siblings and no one else use actually other people use as well. So, um, of course, and as some of the contributors said that, you know, that's, that happens for a number of reasons. Sometimes because people don't have access to that concept, you know, in that language, so they have to create new words. Other times it happens, you know, for humorous effects or to show some like in-groupness, so we all belong to the same, you know, so, sort of identity or to show distance. Um, but yeah, so especially in migrant communities, especially when people have access to multiple codes, that's when there's a lot of uh, hybridity and creativity. Thank you, Anna. Um... Dina Tangari had two questions, but she had to leave. So Spiros has, has posted them on the on the chat. The first question is, what do we foresee to be the future of all the languages of Cyprus? And the second question is, based on our experience and knowledge of each of these languages, what can be done by the government or other funding bodies to maintain or preserve, especially the languages that are spoken by smaller uh, populations of speakers? Um, any any ideas about the future? Um, I think I can take this. Um, well, um, having worked in a revitalization program, um, it, the answer is it depends. Uh, and the other answer is that we linguists don't know. We cannot make predictions. So uh, that's one answer. But uh, we can see the direction of things. And it all boils down to attitudes. Of course, the, the events of 74 had a catalytic effect on Cypriot Arabic, let's say, but attitudes were there even before 74. Uh, they were um, imposed through schooling. Um, and I think that the whole issue of um, teaching that there is only one correct way of saying things, the official way of schooling, that is the, uh, the worst thing you can do for minority languages. So uh, there's only one correct way. There's only standard Greek in the UK. You cannot speak Cypriot Greek, you cannot speak Greek Greek. It's wrong. Um, the Cypriot Arabic sounds just village talk. So you don't speak it. You don't transmit it to your children. So I think it starts from, um, from attitudes and it, it's what we call status building in, uh, in language planning. So that's one aspect, that's one way to go. And of course, uh, uh, documenting languages, uh, um, researching, trying to find, to create material to teach them, that's another venue. But if the native speakers don't want to speak the language, then we're doing nothing. So I say start from there. And, um, uh, yeah, Elena? Well, just, you know, I think just to add on what Spiros uh, said is that, you know, I, I think educational is very important in this aspect and it's, you know, policy. And, and I think that linguists and, and academics can push to this, um, you know, to, uh, to a certain level. Um, this idea of multiplicity, you know, this idea of, you know, education is about, should be about the multiple, you know, Start and that one bringing in one variety doesn't mean that it threatens the other. Uh, we add on the repertoire of, 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 of what we want. It, it, it's the expansion, the addition that we want. And in this sense, I think there is space um, to bring in 
the dialect, you know, the endangered languages, you know, we've got so many things in the curricula, you know, th th there could be space for, 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 la for the languages of, 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 of the country. Um, it's great that you mentioned the curricula because Alexander asked if we think something needs to be done regarding the teaching and encouragement to use in education. I yeah, where is Sabrula Tiblagui? I think she's here. She's here. Yeah. 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 Ah, there she is. But she's muted, no? No. Should be. For, um, for those of you who, um, who are not aware of the educational sort of back to this question, uh, Stavrilati Blackpool, who is um, um, at the Open University of Cyprus, um, was involved in the, the writing and introduction of the new curriculum for the teaching of Greek in mainstream uh, schools in the Republic of Cyprus. Um, the curriculum was introduced in 2010, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. It was the first um, curriculum that um, uh, thoughtfully integrated Cypriot Greek as a linguistic resource that children bring to education uh, in order to develop um, their literacy, their critical literacy, their abilities in the linguistic abilities in both standard Greek and of course uh, Greek. Uh, it was a very um, um, promising, ambitious, exciting project. Uh, it ran for three years, I believe. Uh, it showed extremely results in uh, trials and training with, uh, with teachers, uh, but it was unfortunately withdrawn in 2015 uh, and the curriculum reverted to a previous situation where uh, Super Greek has no uh, place in education. Um, the, uh, both Elena um, and I have done, uh, recently published some work in this area about the benefits of introducing Cypriot Greek in education, both in the mainstream schooling in Cyprus and also in the community schools here in the diaspora. So, Elena, would you like to some of the benefits that we believe are there in integrating Cypriot Greek in education? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, perhaps we could also post the link. I don't know. We have a link for the paper, right? It, it might be interesting. Uh, well, you know, the benefits are, are, are different and they're multiple and um, um, it's it, it's not only about Cypriot Greek, it can be for any dialect in, in, in different countries. Um, it, in terms of, 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 of language awareness, uh, the research has shown it's very important in increasing metalinguistic awareness in the students, so understanding what each variety is for and understanding structures and 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 grammar of, of, of the varieties in terms of attitudes is also very important in values what Spiros said before um, and of, of identity of of of, of making the, the home variety visible and valuable uh, but also on using different different texts because the dialect is out there it's 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 not something that old people speak. It's as as we've shown in in the presentations, different texts and genres are created in the dialect, and you know students use these texts, and so we it's kind of you know keeping up keeping up with what's going on. So I think that some of the issues we 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 raised. Um, I don't know, uh, Petro, if you would like to add. You know, perhaps Stavrula, are you? Can you hear us now? Can you? Um, yeah, hi, I lost you for a moment there. Yes. Congratulations for the event. Uh, so because I lost you for a moment, I don't know what Elena said, but I'm sure she said what I was going to say, <laughs> because we work together very closely on the uh, education reform. Uh, so yeah, the idea is that you don't have subtractive bilingualism. That doesn't work. One language or one variety does not impede the acquisition of the other. Multiplicity is a gift. Multiplicity helps people cognitively, culturally, multilingualism, translanguaging, hybrid languaging, languages performance are all good things. And when you have uh, a rich and varied environment, such as that of Cyprus, uh, not capitalizing on 
multilingualism or bidialectalism or the existence of linguistic diversity is, uh, to put it simply, a crime. Uh, it doesn't provide children with an accurate idea of how languages are used in the society. It doesn't make children critical readers and writers. It doesn't, it's not good for citizenship. It's not good for identity formation. We attempted back in 2010 education reform, which tried to set the scene for uh, implementing capitalizing on linguistic diversity in language teaching with a view to precisely looking at the sociolinguistic dimensions of language, the cultural dimensions of language, not, and of course the structural aspects, and creating better, more aware, more cognitively and metacognitively and culturally aware and critical language learners. Didn't work, it fell through, but we're still <laughs> trying and carry, trying to carry on at grassroots level with it. Obviously for the diaspora it's crucial to use the home varieties. If you're, if you're going to achieve some meaningful kind of meaningful language learning, that's meaningful not only locally for the communities, but also meaningful in the sense of you know having a, an easy uh, acquisition process, you need to capitalize on the home varieties, even on hybrid and mixed forms. And their cultural significance, which is uh, the other part, which is central and crucial to creating critically literate uh, subjectivities. And that's it for now from me. Um, Petro, can I answer? I think there is a question, there is a, some comments for the Cypriot Greek from Panayotis Theodoulou. Okay, yes, uh, and then we'll... Uh, because, yeah, I'm sorry, I missed it now. Oh. Um, there, he mentions three, three, three observations, and and he's. I just need to clarify a few things. I guess because I was in a hurry. Um, of course, uh, contemporary Cypriot Greek has not derived from, uh, you know, from Arcadian uh, ancient <clears throat> the dialects. It's a, com a completely different set of dialects. What I was referring to at the first two points were the presence of Greek in Cyprus, not of Cypriot Greek. Um, just to clarify this, uh, he also says that uh, we don't. It, it, it has not. Um, we don't know if it's from the 14th BC, but um, I refer to a volume from the archaeologist in Cyprus who kind of set this date in the 14th uh, BC, but the first written scripture we have is from the 11th BC. Um, and what else? Oh, and about the 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 the, the, the Kipriago Silavari again, we've got studies that mention that it's kind it's an it's it's an it, it's an evolved it has it's not derived from it, but it's an it's a kind of um, extended or an an, an ev uh, evolution. So it, it added more syllables and all that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think we'll stop there uh, because we've gone over. Um, our time slightly, ever so slightly, as academics. Um, I would like to thank everyone again very warmly for your contributions tonight, your participation, uh, our lovely uh, participants, audience, for their questions and feedback and encouragement in the chat room. Thanks again to uh, Marius Psaras and the High Commission of the Republic of Cyprus in the UK for the invitation. And what can we say? Um, happy birthday, Cyprus. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Pedro. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. -bye.